All right, let's just make sure the audio and video works. Looks good. Okay, everyone, so welcome to CY Learning's Mutual Fund six week complimentary boot camp webinar number four. So, my name is Jason. I'm your host today. I'm one of the regulatory trainers and study coaches here at CY Learning. We're very excited to have all of you with us here today. Now, just before I dive into the webinar, I just want to share with all of you that we have been having a little bit of issues with our internet service here recently. Uh, no surprises. There's a lot of people working from home these days. So if I do momentarily you know, pause or freeze on video, don't worry. It usually only happens for maybe a few seconds, but the service will keep on running, okay? No matter what though, we will post the recording um, most often, uh, usually Tuesday or Wednesday, usually by the end of Wednesday, we have it up. All right. So if you guys, you know, for whatever reason, have any issues, you know, definitely stay tuned, but you can also watch the recording probably by Wednesday. All right. Let's have a look at today's agenda and see what we have here on our plate. Okay. So you should have your agenda up on the screen. Now today's agenda, we got four items here, probably going to take us, uh, maybe 30 or four minutes to go through. We're gonna start off with a discussion on NAV, that is net asset value, versus uh, NAVPU, that's net asset value per unit or per share. And then we're gonna talk about forward pricing, you know what it is and how it works. We're gonna talk about DCA, that's um, uh, dollar cost averaging, also known as automatic investing. And then finally, we're gonna take up some exam level questions along with our instructor's take on how to approach these exam level questions. I got a surprise for you today. We've got a few more questions than what we've demonstrated in the past. So you're gonna really enjoy today's session. All right, let's get started and start talking about NAV versus NAVPU. So a lot of students, they get confused between NAV and NAVPU. Now on your exam, you'll likely get some questions regarding these concepts. So understanding them can often be the difference between getting marks with confidence or struggling to find the right answer. So let's quickly discuss both concepts. Now NAV, N-A-V, is short for net asset value. And, and all three of these words are really key to understanding what NAV is. So you're looking for the, the assets of the mutual fund, that is what the fund owns, you're looking for the financial value of those assets. And since you want the net value, this means that you have to deduct something and that something is the fund's liabilities or simply what the fund owes. So this means that NAV is simply the value of the fund's assets minus the value of the fund's liabilities. So, so let me give you an example. Let's say a fund's assets are worth $2,000. And the fund's liabilities are much smaller. Perhaps the liabilities are only worth $200. You can probably see it on our screen right now. So what this means is that the NAV is going to be calculated as $2,000 minus $200. And so the actual NAV will work out to be $1,800. Now NAVPU, well, it's simply short for the net asset value per unit or per share of the fund. And I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But what this does is simply combines the NAV with how many units or shares of the fund that all of the investors currently own. So let's use the previous example and assume that there are only a total of 100 units outstanding. This means that the NAV PU is calculated as the $1,800 NAV that we just saw divided by the 100 units and it works out to be simply $18 per unit. Okay, $18 per unit. Now, when investors buy a fund, they're often buying the latest NAVPU, the latest net asset value per unit. So let me ask all of you, how many units would a new investor receive if they were buying the fund? Well, to answer this question, what we do is we simply take the amount of money that's being invested and we divide it by the latest NAVPU or price per unit. So let's continue our example. Let's assume though that a new client is going to invest, uh, uh, let's say $9,000 into the mutual fund. How many units 
for that $9,000 investment would the client receive? How many units? Well, by taking the $9,000 of new money and dividing it by the latest net asset value per unit of $18, we can see that the investor will actually receive 500 units of the fund. Okay, 500 units of the fund. And there you have it. In fact, it's up on the screen right now. Now, for purposes of your emergency funds exam, you have to know what NAV is, how to calculate NAV, what NAV PU is, how to calculate that, what fund price is, you know, different things like that. Because these are all kinds of questions you could very well receive. So definitely make a point to cover this material, cover it well. And if you have any questions, then be sure to ask our trainers when you're talking with them in the complimentary one-on-one -on -one sessions that you can book on Fridays. All right. Okay, let's move on to the next one. What are we talking about next? Forward pricing. Okay. All right. So what is forward pricing? That's a great question. So once a fund company receives an order for a mutual fund, it's got to fill that order. The process that the fund company uses to fill an order is what we call forward pricing. Now here at CY Learning, we do love to use analogies to make concepts a lot more clear. So that's what I'm going to do right now, in fact. All right, so listen closely. Let's imagine that you're at a horse race track right now. Okay, you're watching the track, you're watching the horse race. And in fact, the horse race has already started. You notice that one horse seems to be pulling ahead and, and you think that this horse is going to be lucky and it's going to be the winner. So what do you do? Do you, do you run to the ticket window and immediately try to place a bet on that lucky horse? Do you think that's fair? Well, what do you think the person behind the ticket would likely say to you? Probably something like this. Hey, you can't do that. That's not fair to everybody else. You got to wait until the next race. Well, the point is this. With mutual funds, you can't just buy in between valuation points. A mutual fund company will take your order now, but will only process your order at the next valuation point in order to be fair to all investors. So when is the next valuation point? Well, many mutual funds will value their fund daily. However, some funds will only value their funds weekly or, or maybe even monthly. Valuing a fund simply means that the fund company is determining the net asset value per unit, right? Or, or simply just the unit price. Now, all of the orders placed prior to market close on the valuation date will receive that NAVPU, that net asset value per unit price. So it works like this. The mutual fund company receives a whole bunch of orders, some buy orders, some sell orders, and even some other orders called switches. And this is covered in your books. So I'm not going to discuss these types of orders, right? But what happens is this. The company determines the net asset value per unit at the end of the day after the market's closed on that valuation date. And each order that's been placed before the market closes will then receive that net asset value per unit price for that day. So orders placed after the market close will have to wait and receive the next valuation dates price. Let me talk about an example. Let's say a mutual fund only gets valued once per month on the last trading day of the month, whatever that day is. That's, that's the valuation date, the last trading day of the month. Now, as you can see on your screen, Let's say that investor Joe decided to place a buy order for $10,000 of a mutual fund exactly one minute after the market closed. I mean, it's only one minute. Do you think that would give him today's NAVPU? Or do you think the fund company would make him wait until the next valuation date? What do you guys think? Well, you probably have to wait until the next valuation point and he's going to receive whatever that price is. Okay. Let's find out if that's the right answer. Yes, it is. B is the right answer. The price as of the next valuation date. Now on a side note, if you've got one of our mutual fund subscription packages, 
you'll find a video where one of our trainers, Andre, covers Ford pricing to much more detail than what I just did right now. So I do definitely encourage all of you to watch that video. All right, let's talk about DCA, dollar cost averaging, also known as automatic investing. Now, a lot of clients want to become investors and start to save money towards their goals. And perhaps their goal is a retirement, perhaps their goals are paying for their young child's future college, or university education, etc. But they can't put away large lump sum amounts all at once. I mean, it's really hard for people to do, right? So how do they get started? Well, that's exactly what DCA or dollar cost averaging is for. Dollar cost averaging is simply a strategy that allows people to put away money at regular intervals over a period of time. And for many people, they might make weekly or monthly contributions toward their retirement savings or, or you know, their TFSA, right? So the key point is this, the same amount is invested at regular intervals. So they're putting away the same amount consistently. Perhaps it's as little as $25 or, or $50 or, or $100 per week or, or per month to just get started. So over time, they continue to regularly put away that same amount and the accumulated value of their savings will grow. Now, the secret to accumulating wealth really is this. If there's a secret, it's this, the earlier that you start, the better off that you're gonna be in the long run. However, dollar cost averaging can really help you a lot by doing two things for you. First, when stock prices drop, such as what's been happening the last couple of weeks, then dollar cost averaging allows you to buy more of your investment when prices are low. And this is a good thing. Imagine this, imagine you can get two pizzas for the price of one, and both are of the same quality. I think most people would rather take two pizzas than one. Or, or imagine you could get two shares for the price that you would have paid for one share before the stock price dropped. I think most people would rather have two shares than one. So again, much like my analogies, dollar cost averaging works in your favor. The second thing that dollar cost averaging does though is really powerful. As you can see, it eliminates the need to guess or to time the market. So all you really need to do is keep doing what you're doing. That is investing. It's automatic, so you don't have to think about it. Now, I know some really, really smart people. In fact, I even work with some really smart people, but nobody can guess where the market's gonna go up, where it's gonna go down, or when that's gonna happen. So the strategy of dollar cost averaging simply works by allowing you to buy more when prices are low and by eliminating the need for you to make decisions that even I can't make. All right, let's dive into some questions. By the way, if you guys hear any noise in the background, I do apologize for that. It sounds like somebody outside is using a, a weed blower or, or you know one of those uh, leaf blowers. Again, my apologies. More importantly, let's dive into some questions. All right, are you guys ready? Let's put on your thinking caps right now and let's have a look at what question number one has in store for us. Okay, question number one. Question number one. Oh, this is a good question. This is a good question. It says, ABC Fund has total assets of $10 million, liabilities of $1 million, and 350,000 units outstanding. Assume the fund charges a 3% front end load and an MER of 2.5%. What is the fund's NAV PU? Okay, so MER is management expense ratio. That's covered in your studies. You guys should know what that is by now. NAV PU, of course, is net asset value per unit. All right, what, what, are our, uh, what are our four answer choices here? Let me just switch on my laser pointer. There we go. Okay, so we've got A, 25.71. B, 26.48, C, 9 million, and D, 9,278,350. Wow, that's a big number. Okay, you know what? This is a good question. It's got a lot of moving parts in here, I can see. I mean, we've got, we've got things like a, a 3% front-end load. We've got an MER of 2.5%. We've got assets, liabilities, a number of units. Guys, 
RTQF. Do you guys remember what that means, RTQF? Read the question first. Let, let me look at the question. What does the question say? It says, what is the fund's net asset value per unit? It's looking for the NAV PU. Okay. You know, you know what? This is why it's so important to RTQF. There's stuff in this scenario that in my opinion really are just distractors and we simply don't need in order to solve this question. I mean, we don't need to know what the front end load is. I don't think we need to know what the MER is either. So what we really need to do is we need to focus on the last three letters of the acronym. That, that is VPU value per unit, right? Value per unit, because that's really what the question's asking you. Now, secondly, is there anything that we can eliminate pretty quickly? Well, I'm looking at these four answer choices. They're all numbers. They're all, you know, two of them are really big numbers and two of them are really small numbers. Okay, now I know that NAV PU and that asset value per unit is a price. It's a dollar amount. I know that for sure. Okay, but you know, if, if there's anything I could eliminate probably pretty quickly, I, I think it's probably these two really big numbers here, right? Because I know, you know, that, that maybe... You know, I, I, I know that the average investor, you know, people like you and I probably are not going to be able to, you know, afford to drop over $9 million to buy units of a mutual fund, you know, so long as we realize that we're dealing with per unit pricing. So we can probably get rid of C and D pretty quickly because those numbers are so big, they just don't make a lot of sense. All right. So my, my guess right now is we're narrowing it down to A and B, right? But more importantly, how do we calculate net asset value per unit. Well, it's simply this. It's a formula. It's just the fund assets minus the fund liabilities. Take that result and divide it by the number of units. Okay, so to be clear, the fund assets are $10 million. We subtract the liabilities of $1 million. So this means, you know, the top of our formula is going to be $9 million. And we divide it by the units outstanding, which is 350,000 units. So $9 million divided by 350,000 units should work out to be $25.71 per unit, 25.71. By the way, if you guys are wondering how I came up with that number, I'm gonna show you right now. <laughs> it's really simple. I'm using my calculator and that is my trusty HP 10B2 plus calculator. It's the same one we use in our financial math videos. It's the same one we recommend here at CY Learning. Okay, but let's find out if I'm right. Yes, I am. There we go. 2571. All right. So before we move on, I just want to make a quick note about NAVPU. Okay. Um, mutual funds that are structured as trusts will issue what's called units. All right. So we say net asset value per unit. However, you've heard me say this a few minutes ago per share, mutual funds that are structured as corporations are going to issue shares, right? So we say net asset value per share. So, you know, you'll often hear the words net asset value per unit, net asset value per share, they're thrown around. In common language, net asset value per unit and net asset value per share are used interchangeably, all right? They're used interchangeably. So although there is a slight technical difference, per unit means it was issued by a trust, per share means it was issued by a corporation, there's a slight technical difference. Most people just treat those two different things as the same, all right? So if you see NAVPU or NAVPS on your exam, just realize you're talking about the same thing, all right? Great question, that one. All right, let's go on to question number two. Here we go. Okay. I have it up on the screen. DEF fund has total assets of $15 million, liabilities of $1,250,000 and 350,000 shares outstanding. Assume the fund charges a 4% back end load upon redemption and a MER of 2.75%. What is the fund's NAV? Okay, and again, NAV is net asset value. 
MER is management expense ratio, okay? And again, we've got four different answer choices here. Two of them are really small. <laughs> Two of them are huge. Two of them are huge. Okay. Okay. You know what? This, like the, like question number one, this is also a good question. Um, it seems to have a lot of moving parts as well. Again, first step I'm going to always emphasize is RTQF. Read the question first. I want you guys to note this. There's a, there's a difference between this one and question number one, right? Question number one was asking about your NAVPU per unit. This one, Phil, is asking about the NAV, just the NAV, net asset value, okay? And, and, I, and I think really this is why it's so important to RTQF. I mean, there's stuff in this, you know, this, this scenario that really are distractors, and you really need to focus down, you know, on to what's important in order to solve this question. I mean, we don't need to know the back end load amount. You know, we don't need to know the MER. We just need to know really how to calculate net asset value, right, for the fund. Okay. Now, before I move on, I always look at my four answer choices. I always read them, right? Two are small, two are large. And I ask myself, is there anything I can really eliminate quickly? Okay. Why well, I know we're not looking for a per unit price now. Per unit prices tend to be fairly small. They usually are under $100, right? These are great big quantities here. These are over, you know, 12 and $13 million each. Um, these are two small numbers here. So I'm looking for the NEV. I'm, I'm probably looking for, you know, a large number than a small number. So I won't need these small numbers. Because again, these are per unit prices. So if I was to eliminate anything right now, I'd probably eliminate A and B. I'd get rid of them. Right, and, and I'd narrow it down to C and D just you know for my common sense about what NEV is. Okay. So how do we calculate NEV? Well, we, we kind of just did that. NEV is simply fund assets minus fund liabilities. Right? And as you can see in the question, we got $15 million of fund assets. We subtract our fund liabilities of $1,250,000. And if I do the math, let me just quickly do the math here. Let's see here. $15 million minus $1,250,000. I get an answer of $13,750,000. Okay, $13,750,000. All right, so that's C. I think that's C. Okay, let me just double check here. Yes, it is. That's the answer. It's C. Okay. Um, Guys, you know, I, I want to make a quick note before we go on, Phil, uh, about number D, about 12, you know, 750, about this D answer here, okay? Really be careful when you're doing math. I mean, a lot of times, even myself included, I'm very tempted to do mental math, right? Just do it in my head. Okay? And most of the time, I'm pretty good. Sometimes I make mistakes, right? And I've seen a lot of people look at questions like this and, and try to do the math in their head. And I've seen a lot of students say to themselves, okay, okay. I've got $15 million. I take away a million dollars. There's the one. Oh, I'm, I'm taking away more than a million dollars. Let's just say I take away two. Okay. Um, so that brings me down to 13 million. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I got, I got to take away 250,000 as well. So I know it's going to be, you know, maybe 12. No, it's 13,750. The point is this. A lot of people make simple mistakes, right? And so for this reason, guys like me like to create exam questions and we like to throw answer choices in there sometimes that really nail you for making simple mistakes. So really pay attention. If you're not sure, definitely do what I just did. Double check the math with your calculator, okay? A lot. There are some people out there, I'm not gonna say a lot, but there are some people out there that would have chosen answer D maybe at random, but, you know, maybe based on their mental math, and as a result, got this question wrong, all right? So be careful about this, be careful. All right, let's move on to question number three. Question three. Okay, question three, it says, JKL fund is valued once per week on Fridays. On Saturday, June 13th, Paul completed an application to invest $250,000. Given the following information, how many units would Paul own? Guys, give me a quick second. I just had a message come in. 
Terry wants you to go through the math on question number two again. Sure, I could do that. I don't mind doing that at all. Okay. I'll tell you what, guys. Give me a second here. Before I dive forward in question three, let me go back to question two. All right. So, Terry, if you're watching, this is for you, my friend. Okay. Let's see here. There we go. There we go. Okay. So, we've got $15 million dollars. Right? This is the fund asset. Well, the question is a NAV. What's the fund's NAV, the net asset value? All right. Oh, there we go. Okay, so the question is, what is the fund's NAV, net asset value? We've got a total assets of $15 million. To calculate the NAV, we simply have to take the assets minus the fund's liability. So we take what it owns and we subtract what it owes. Okay, so $15 million minus $1,250,000. Do the math on that one. That work out to be $13,750,000. Again, $13,750,000. All right, so that's the math behind question number two. All right, again, key point here was recognizing that question two is talking about the NAV, whereas question number one was talking about the NAV PU, the net asset value per unit. All right, so Terry, that one's for you. Okay, let's go on to question number three. Here we go, question number three. Okay, so JKL Fund is valued once per week on a Friday. On Saturday, June 13th, Paul completed an application to invest $250,000. Given the following information in that table, it looks like, how many units would Paul own? Okay, and I, I can see we've got a, we've got two valuation dates here. We've got the asset value, the fund on those dates, the liability value, the fund on those date, and it looks like the amount of units outstanding for the fund on those dates as well. All right, so given the following information, how many units would Paul own? And he's investing $250,000. Okay, guys, this is a great question as well. Um, again, what's our first step in solving these kinds of questions? RTQF, read the question first. So this question is asking about how many units would Paul own, right? So this question is really testing, I think, on whether students know forward pricing and how forward pricing works. And I, I actually think it actually does something else too. I think this question also tests students on whether you know if you can buy partial units, also known as fractional units, okay? Because I, I can see, I'm looking at these two answer choice, of these four answer choices here, and I can see answer A is whole units, where answer B is what we call partial or fractional units, C is also whole units, but D is also partial or fractional units as well, okay? So to answer that question, and again, this is covered in your study material, the answer is yes, you can definitely buy partial or fractional units with mutual funds. In fact, that's one of the things that separate them from shares. Um, very often, you can't do that with stock, okay? All right, so how do we calculate how many units can be bought? Well, the first thing we need to do, obviously, is to calculate the NAV PU, the net asset value per unit that Paul has to buy at, all right? So, um, let me see here. When did he buy this? Uh, on Saturday, June 13th, he completed the application to invest 250,000. Okay, so he placed the order on the Saturday, June 13th. I see the valuation date on Friday, June 12th. His order is after that date. So again, he's not gonna get Friday, June 12th pricing. He has to wait until the next valuation date. And the next valuation date is Friday, June the 19th. So the first thing we gotta do is figure out what valuation date to use we're gonna to have to use Friday, June the 19th, okay? Now to calculate the NAV PU, we've, you saw us do this on, on question number one just a few minutes ago. We're gonna take the fund assets, we're gonna subtract the fund liabilities, we're gonna take that result and we're simply gonna divide it by the outstanding number of units to figure out what the NAV PU is, okay? So let me see if, um, do I have that on the screen? I don't have that on the screen, that's fine. All right, $10,100,000 in fund assets. We're gonna subtract 
$850,000 in liabilities. So let me just see what that works out to be here. $10,100,000 in fund assets minus $850,000 in liabilities. So that works out to be $9,250,000. That's the NAV. Okay, $9,250,000 is the NAV. I divide that by the number of units, which is 400,000, divided by 400,000. And so then my NAVPU works out to be $23.13, rounded. Okay, it's actually 23.1250, but I'm simply rounding it to two decimal places, which is $23.13 rounded, okay? So then what we have to do is we simply have to take that amount that he's invested, $250,000, and divide it by that NAVPU. And you guys have seen me do this before, $250,000 invested divided by $23.13. Let me just do the math divided by $23.13, works out to be 10,808.4738 units. Okay, 10,808.47 units that uh, Paul can purchase. All right, let me just see if I'm right here. Yes, it is. <laughs> Good thing it's right. Good thing. All right, so again, key point here, number one, um, you've got to know how to calculate, you know, how many units somebody would own based on an invested amount and based on their NAVPU. But secondly, you should also know that, you know, mutual funds, um, you can buy them in fractional units or, you know, partial units. Uh, that's one of the advantages of mutual funds. Okay. So it's a great thing to know. Great question. Certainly an exam level question as well. All right. Let's move on to uh, question number four. I think question number four is going to be our last question. Yep. What does it say here? It says Adam invests Adam invests $100 per month for retirement. The last 3 months of mutual fund unit prices are January $100, February $50, and March $75. Based on these prices, how has Adam's retirement fund performed? Guys, this is a fantastic exam level question. You know what? Those first three questions were good. This one I think is great. This is a great question, okay? This question really tests your knowledge of dollar cost averaging. But I think this question actually does more than that. It also tests our knowledge of how mutual fund pricing and transactions work, okay? Now, at a glance, at a glance, it kind of looks like Adam might have lost some money, right? I mean, I mean, January's mutual fund price is $100, right? And he's putting in $100 a month. But that mutual fund price goes down to $50 in February. And, and even though it recovers in March, it's still down, right? So, so you know, off the top of my head, it, it, it kind of looks like he might have lost money, right? So if, so if I don't know how to do dollar cost averaging, I, I might lean towards A or B. Right, but you know what? I, I think I think we really need to do some math to nail this one down properly. Yeah. Okay. Now, I want to make a quick point before we go on here. Okay. In this question, we're exaggerating a little bit. All right. I mean, most mutual funds are built and constructed in such a way that it's actually really really hard for them to drop from say a hundred dollar you know per unit price down to $50 per unit price in a month. I mean, that's a 50% drop in price. That's a really hard thing to actually do um, in reality. So I want to be clear. This is an exam level question, not necessarily meant to reflect reality. We are exaggerating a bit here. But more importantly, if you don't understand dollar cost averaging yet and how it works, then you should by the end of this question. Okay, so pay careful attention. All right. So, you know what? I, you know what? Here's a great approach. Here's a great approach. Okay. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring up a spreadsheet for you guys. I'm going to bring up a spreadsheet and show you the math, right? So you guys can see this live. I, I normally just do this on a calculator, but I think a spreadsheet might make it more clear for you. Let me, let me bring up a spreadsheet. Let me see here. Let me see if I can bring that for, uh, for you guys. Let me see here.
Okay. Okay, I got a spreadsheet on the screen. Let me uh, let me just make this. A, my 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 screen is very high resolution, so I'm gonna make this a little more clear for you. Let me just zoom in a bit. Let me see here. 240. Oh, what the heck? I'll bring up 250. That'll probably suffice. Okay, and then just make everything here dollars. Okay. Um, invested. One hundred dollars per month. Okay. All right. So guys, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you how to do the math of this dollar cost averaging question on the spreadsheet. I want to be clear here. I'm not teaching Excel. You know, Microsoft Excel. I'm not teaching spreadsheets. I assume all of you guys have got the basics of spreadsheets. But you know what? If you follow along, this should make it really clear for you. And if you guys have any questions, definitely ask us on Friday. Okay, definitely ask us a Friday. All right, all right. So let's do this. Um, I know Adam is investing a hundred dollars per month for retirement. So let me let me just bring it back to that for a quick second. Here's question four. He's investing a hundred dollars per month for retirement. The last three months, the mutual fund, the, the unit prices are January one hundred dollars, February fifty dollars, and March seventy five dollars. So January's a hundred. February's 50 and March is 75. Let me set this up on my spreadsheet for you. Okay, let's do this. All right, here's the month. Okay, we've got January, we've got February, and we've got March. Okay, and let's do the invested amount. Okay, let's do, let's in fact do the, the, the value per unit. That's the price per unit, okay? And let's figure out how many units are actually bought. Okay, let me just expand these columns here. Here we go, okay. Okay, that makes sense, that makes sense. All right, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so each month Adam's investing, whoops, $100. He's gonna put in $100 in January, $100 in February, and $100 in March, okay? now. In January, according to the question, the unit price, the value per unit, the unit price, nav PU if you want, was $100. And in February, what was the unit price in February? The unit price in February was $50 and March it was 75. Okay, so in February the unit price is $50 and in March the unit price is $75. So what we really wanna know is, okay, how many units did I to buy each month and what's his total amount of units that he bought? Okay, so Adam bought, let me see here. He invested $100, he got a unit price of $100, right? So if he bought you know, a unit and it cost him $100 and the unit price is $100, he can only buy one unit. That makes a lot of sense, right? We're taking the amount that he invested, $100, dividing it by the unit price and FPU Okay, in fact, if you want, I'll even call this NavPU. I'll expand that column a bit. All right, so he bought only one unit that month in January. Okay, how many units did he buy in February? Well, he again invested $100, but this time each unit was only priced at $50. So he was able to buy two units. Two units, that's great. Okay, so he bought one unit in January and went two units in February. You, you know what, we, we need a running total. Let's do a running total. Total units. Let's do a running total. Okay, let me just expand this a bit as well. There we go, okay. So in January he bought one unit. In February, well in February he already owned one unit and he bought two more. So at the end of February he owns three units. Okay, he owns three units at the end of February. March, he invested yet another hundred dollars. All right, so what did he do with that? Well, he invested the hundred dollars. He paid a unit price of $75 per unit. How many units did he buy? Well, he can certainly buy one, but I think he can actually buy more than one because again, we can do fractional shares or fractional units. So he bought 1.33 units 
in March. Okay, 1.33 units in March. So at this point, at the end of March, he owns three units from the end of February, plus he owns his 1.33 units that he bought in March. He now owns a total of 4.33 units. He owns a total of 4.33 units. In fact, this is an important figure. I'm gonna make this bold, okay? 4.33 units, all right? Let me, uh, let, me, let me create a quick total here as well, okay? So how much is the total amount that Adam's invested so far? Well, he's invested a total of $300, all right? Total of $300. But he owns now 4.33 units. But what's a unit? What are those units now worth? What's the net asset value per unit right now? Well, those units right now are only worth $75 each, right? Let's do some simple math. Let's take the amount of units that he owns and let's multiply it by the value of those units and figure out what the total value of his units that he owns are. $325, okay? So if I take 4.33 units and multiply that by his latest NEVPU, $75, then his units in total are worth $325, okay? So on paper, what I would say is this, I would say so far Adams invested a total of $300. On paper, his units right now are worth $325, I would say he's got a gain right now of $25, a simple gain of $25, okay? Now, I wanna be clear. I say on paper for a reason, because on paper, that's what it works out to be, okay? But if Adam put in a sale transaction, as you guys all know already, he's gonna get the NEVPU at the next valuation date, okay? That NEVPU could be slightly higher, could be lower than this, could be more than 75, could be less than 75. We don't know, right? But the key point is right now, if he was looking at a statement and trying to determine, you know, what it's worth, it's worth $325, he's got a gain of $25, okay? So hopefully that this simple example will make things a little bit more clear for you. Normally I would do this math on a calculator and, and do it pretty quickly, but I thought you guys might benefit from seeing on a spreadsheet today, all right? Let's go back to the question itself. Okay, so this is question four. Uh, A lost 75, nope. B lost 25, nope. D, no gain or loss, no. C is our gain of 25. That matches what we just figured out on the spreadsheet. I'm gonna figure out at C. And there you go, it is. It's a gain of $25. Guys, hopefully you got a lot of value from that. Um, more importantly, I, I, would, I would definitely say this, okay? Um, you guys should know how dollar cost averaging works, right? Definitely for your exam, you gotta know how it works. Perhaps more importantly though, be able to explain how it works to a potential client one day. And if you can do that, you probably have a solid grasp on, on this concept, okay? Now, on a side note, uh, one of our trainers, Andre, did make a video very recently called, um, Should I Buy Stocks? during the COVID-19 pandemic, right? It's a great video. Um, you know, it talks about, surprise, surprise, dollar cost averaging. The video itself is available on our YouTube channel. I do encourage all of you to subscribe to our YouTube channel and watch that video, okay? It's free, but again, the video is called Should I Buy Stocks During the COVID-19 Pandemic? It's a great video. Definitely watch it and subscribe to our CY Learning YouTube channel. All right. All right, guys, I think that's the last question for today. Let's move on to the very end. Yep, it's uh, what's next. Okay, so as I always like to say at the very end, definitely make sure to keep track of your progress using the CY Learning Study Schedules that all of you should have. They are you know, available at this particular link down here. They're available at our bootcamp link, okay? Um, you know, as you complete different activities on that study schedule, put a, you know, a check mark or a tick mark beside those activities. Follow along. I always find that the process of ticking things off, you know, indicating that I've got them done is really helpful and, and very motivational for me to keep going with my studies. All right. 
Secondly, if you have an active subscription, definitely book a complimentary one-on-one session for next Friday below. Use that link, cylearning.com forward slash bootcamp. Again, I want to emphasize that space is limited. It is on a first come first serve basis. I had some great conversations this past Friday. I know Andre and Corey had some great conversations as well. I, th I think I think one of our other trainers, Josh, was also um, you know taking a few of the mutual fund conversations too. So uh, you know, definitely, we've got some spots. Book that on Friday, and I look forward to chatting with all of you. Let me just see if I can bring up our YouTube channel right now and see if there's any remaining questions. Let me see here. Let me see here. Thanks for participating. When you went right is wrong. Okay, you need to be very careful. Terry was clear. Thanks, guys. NAV equals answer B. Okay. Guys, I don't see any outstanding questions right now. I'm just quickly looking through the YouTube stream. No. All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it back. There we go. Guys, good luck with your studies and stay safe out there. Take care. Bye-bye.